Hey everyone, this is Nick and today I've got what is probably the longest Linux and open source news video that I ever made. It's long but don't worry, it's packed with interesting stuff. Among the usual app updates and new projects, we've got more details about Elementary OS 7 and specifically the fact that it's going to let you upgrade in place, finally. We also have an unofficial SteamOS ISO, which is the closest thing you can get to the real thing from Valve. And we have the only major update to the Unity desktop in six years. Yes, it is still alive. Just like today's sponsor makes me feel more alive because they take care of all my Linux server needs. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer select a few configuration options and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment, but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. Go ahead, I don't need the money anyway. From Focal Board, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credits and get started. So, GNOME app developers brought some nice big changes again to the core GNOME applications, interface, and to apps from the GNOME circle. The big change that is planned is two-dimensional gestures for GNOME Shell, which means you'll be able to do workspace switching while doing the overview gesture. It might not sound like much, but it should make using these touchpad and touchscreen gestures a lot smoother. Shortwave, the web radio player, now supports GNOME's dark mode, and it uses libadvita. Login Manager Settings, an app that does exactly what its name says, now has settings for the mouse cursor, it supports right-to-left languages, and it's now on Flathub. Emberall, the new music player, got some design tweaks and some stability and reliability updates. Other apps got some smaller changes as well. I just love these weekly updates to various applications and projects. It's so cool to see great design and really well-involved developers. I love it. Microsoft has now joined the Open3D Foundation, joining the likes of Adobe, Amazon Web Services, Huawei, Intel, or Niantic. As a reminder, the Open3D Foundation is the organization who handles the Open3D engine, whose source was donated by Amazon. Microsoft will get a member in the governing board as the company joined as a premier member, which means they should have donated some nice amount of money to the project. It's easy to see how Microsoft might benefit from investing in an open engine, as they could more easily place integrations with their own graphics APIs, various Windows APIs, and maybe even offer it to developers who want to make games for Xbox or Windows as they had already open sourced their game development kit last year, containing all the tools needed to build games for Game Pass for PC, Xbox consoles, and xCloud. I, for one, am glad to see big companies like Microsoft investing in open source software, even if it's only to further their own goals, and not specifically for the good of the whole open source community. In the end, we've got better software for everyone, and these kind of organizations generally have a good governance board that prevents giant companies from imposing their own vision. If you've been lusting after a SteamOS 3 ISO to install on your own desktop or laptop or to create your own Steam console, there are good news. Holo ISO isn't an official release from Valve, but it's the closest thing yet. It packages everything from SteamOS, as it's currently available on the Steam Deck, in a convenient ISO that you can install on any computer. You get the first run experience, the KDE desktop mode, AMD FSR, the game scope compositor, basically every single feature of SteamOS, but you also get its current limitations. The ISO won't work at all on NVIDIA based systems, as NVIDIA drivers and game scope don't really know how to talk to each other yet, and Intel based computers will also require package downgrades. If your device runs on AMD hardware though, you should be up and running in no time. I'd personally rather wait for the official ISO, I'm not in such a hurry, but if you are, that's the closest thing yet. KDE developers are getting into high gear to prepare the release of Plasma 5.25 next month, 
And this means more weekly updates. A ton of stuff has been ported to Qt quick, so they should align more with modern KDE UI design on top of offering streamlined code and better separated internals. New features include support for exporting searchable PDFs using OCR in ScanPage, Dolphin letting you sort files by file extension, and the Plasma Wayland section lets you use resolutions beyond the officially supported ones. Applications using the Desktop Portals API now have a better app chooser dialog to choose which app to open a file with. And there's a new preference to decide if you want to skip minimized tasks when scrolling over the task manager. In the visual department, Nicolo Venerandi has also pretty much completed work on floating panels, which means your plasma panels will now be able to float above the screen edge if you so choose, although that change might not make it to 5.25. I really hope it does though, as these floating panels were one of the main reasons I used Latte Duck back when I used KDE Plasma. Eye candy, it's worth every crash. If you thought Unity died when Ubuntu ditched it for GNOME, well, turns out you were wrong. Unity 7 got its first new major release in six years with a bunch of new changes. It brings a redesigned dash and HUD and the whole desktop has a flatter, more modern look while keeping the blur Unity users are used to. All the docs menus and tooltips have also been redesigned and speed improvements have been brought to the whole desktop, including on the low graphics mode. RAM usage has been reduced to about 700 to 800 megabytes and plenty of bugs have also been fixed, including the empty trash button in the dock and broken app info and ratings in the dash preview. Unity 7.6 is now also completely migrated to GitLab which should help people contribute, and it now compiles on Ubuntu 22.04 as well. Looking at the screenshots, it does indeed look pretty good. And Unity is a desktop I loved and that I always regretted that Ubuntu kind of abandoned when they moved back to GNOME. So for nostalgia's sake, I will probably give it another go and another look, maybe next month. Matthew Miller, the Fedora project lead, was recently interviewed by Tech Republic on the future of Linux. The whole interview is an interesting read, but here are some highlights. Matthew points out that there is no mass market for operating systems, which does limit the growth of the Linux desktop. People just don't generally think about that stuff. As such, he thinks we need to take a different approach to marketing Linux than it's tech and it's super interesting. Matthew thinks that our messaging should be built around the fact that you own the OS and its applications and that you are in control without falling into the, if it's free, you're the product pit. He also says that Fedora's vision isn't to get it running everywhere, but to build an open and inclusive community that benefits everyone. Matthew points out that while having developers is crucial, non-technical contributors are severely lacking, like writers, artists, communicators, and organizers. The interview continues on to talk about Fedora, its mission, its five-year plan, and the benefits of the open source community. It's a very interesting read, and I'm not just saying that because I use and love Fedora. Promise. Danielle Foray published a new blog post detailing the latest changes in elementary OS 6 and the plans for OS 7. It's now possible to set the super key to display the multitasking view, which is a change that GNOME users might find pretty useful. And you can now set the refresh rate for IMAP in online accounts. The window manager has plenty of bug fixes to better handle the multitasking view when display configuration change, and code, the text editor slash IDE, can now understand regular expressions when searching. It displays hidden folders in the sidebar, and a few crashes were fixed. As per OS 7, while well, there is no firm release date, as the work continues to complete all issues assigned to this version, we know it will be codenamed Horus, that it won't have many major new features compared to OS 6, apart from power profiles, automatic app updates, a new minimal music player, and a lot of migration to GDK4 for a lot of components. Wayland is still not planned, but there will finally be a way to upgrade from OS 6 to OS 7, without needing to reinstall everything. Apart from the galactic heresy that is linked to this codename, the upgrade tool alone should be a huge boon for all elementary OS users. And since Elementary is also a rolling release as far as the desktop and default apps are concerned, then it's probably going to get more and more interesting features as it evolves. Looks like the Pine Buds weren't just an April's Fools, as the Pine64 is planning to make their own wireless headphones, 
complete with ambient and environment noise cancellation, and a long battery life. Of course, as with all Pine products, they will be user flashable, so people can experiment with weird use cases or just fun projects. As always, they will get the community involved, and if that community grows, then the product will have assured longevity. The first step is to let developers tinker with the board, which features Bluetooth 5, two coaxial optical input and outputs, a 3.5mm audio jack, and 4.4 and 2.5mm balanced jacks, as well as USB-C and ports for touch and an LCD. We'll have to see how much interest there is in this project, but I always loved the Pine 64's approach to hardware development, so I'm pretty confident. While I firmly believe that Flatpak is the future of application distribution on Linux, there is no denying that this future is not there just yet. That's kind of the definition of the future, I guess. In the meantime, a lot of programs are only distributed through Debian packages and PPAs for Ubuntu. And for that, there is a new tool built by Martin Wimpress, ex-canonical employee. Debget wants to replicate apt-get functionality, but for external Debian packages and repos. The tool has a curated list of repos that it can download stuff from, and it can keep your apps updated as well. It works through the command line exclusively for now and has a very similar syntax to apt-get. It will automatically install any required dependencies, and it already has a pretty nice list of applications, including Google Chrome, VS Code, Discord, Dropbox, Figma, OnlyOffice, Spotify, Zoom, and a lot more. If you prefer regular Debian packages, but you don't want the hassle of dealing with all these PPAs and the consequences of using such PPAs when upgrading to the newest release of your distro, then this tool is definitely something that you should look into. If you're an Apple Music user, but you also run Linux, you might be delighted to learn of the existence of Cider, an open source application that lets you listen to Apple Music using the official Apple API. It's based on Vue.js and Electron, so don't expect a full native client for GNOME or KDE. And it doesn't support Apple's lossless audio, apparently because the API won't let them. But the quality is supposedly higher than the web version of Apple Music or what iTunes plays. It's also available on macOS and Windows, and it's on FlatHub if you're using Linux. It also integrates Apple Podcasts, Lyrics, Spatial Audio, and a remote control feature to let you control music from your iPhone. It even has a system tray icon. A system tray icon. What is this, man? 2006? Now, come on, I'm joking. For a music player, a system tray icon is super useful. And it also might double as a nice Apple Podcast client if you like to sync playback between your phone and your computer. Do you like Steam on Linux, but do you wish it was available as a snap? Maybe not, but apparently some people did, and so it happened. Ubuntu actually is trying to focus more on gaming-related features, and their first step is to introduce Steam in the Snap Store, as a beta for now. They say Ubuntu is the most popular distro for gaming, basing themselves on a Steam survey, and they deduced from these numbers that about 250,000 people use Ubuntu to play games. The Steam Snap doesn't do anything special compared to its previous Debian package version or to the Flatpak release, but I guess it will be easier to maintain there, as Ubuntu seems decided to keep moving with snaps over other packaging formats. I mean, I'm not a Snap fan, personally, but if it helps Ubuntu users get a user-friendly and easy access to Steam and all its games, then it's all good. And while Ubuntu's market share in the gaming sector has been slowly falling, it is still the most popular distro out there, so getting these kind of packages is always nice. Firefox has existed for 17 years, and it has now reached version 100. While that's an arbitrary number, with what some would qualify as minor versions getting a major number, it's still a big milestone, and it has new features to celebrate it. The picture-in-picture -picture mode now supports captions and subtitles from YouTube, Amazon Prime Video, and Netflix, and every site that uses the web VTT format. Firefox can also spell check in multiple languages instead of just one. And the new GDK scroll bars are now implemented by default. There are also improvements to video playback for Windows and Mac OS, including HDR support on the latter, and hardware-accelerated AV1 video decoding on the former for GPUs that support it. Let's hope Firefox will be able to celebrate another 100 versions. And if you want to know why that's important, check out this video. The Linux App Summit has taken place, and there's one talk that specifically piqued my interest regarding FlatHub. 
It seems that the app repository is growing quite fast, having reached 1600 applications and 1.2 petabytes of downloads, which roughly corresponds to 4.5 million apps downloaded each month and 10 million updates. The two speakers also presented a few interesting things happening on Flatpak and Flathub, namely portals, which seem to be the true Linux desktop API, as they let you interact with the system safely without having to use various methods and underlying systems that come from different frameworks. They also reiterated that Flathub's goal was not to package apps, but to offer a distribution platform where developers have control. They cite a few examples like OBS, Bottles, or even Microsoft Edge, published by Microsoft directly to Flathub for easy distribution on the Steam Deck, after the Flathub team reached out to them to let them know there was an easier way than what they had initially wanted to use. The speakers also said they want to focus on letting developers make money off of their applications if they so choose, without going into the traditional App Store model people know on Android or iOS. They're implementing developers and user accounts, with a verification system, various sliders to let developers decide how much they want for their work, as a payment or as an optional donation, with options to donate to various projects instead if the developer doesn't want to keep the money for themselves. They also concluded on the various issues that Flatpak still has, like permissions not being correctly set up on all apps, screen sharing problems and others. All in all, it was a great talk, and I really encourage you to watch it in its entirety, especially if you want to know why I think that Flatpak and Flathub are the future of app distribution on Linux. You might remember the Kubuntu Focus, a very powerful laptop for gaming, or anything else that requires intense graphics and processing power. Well, there's a new version of that device, the Focus M2. It comes with an i7-12700H, a 165Hz 1440p display at 15 inches, and up to 64GB of RAM, complete with Thunderbolt 4, up to an RTX 3080 Ti, and 4TB of NVMe SSD storage. It starts at $895 US, and it's a chunky device at 2.4 kilograms, made out of aluminium, which also embarks tons of ports like USB-C, multiple USB-A, headphone and mic jacks, Thunderbolt, mini display port, HDMI, micro SD, and Ethernet. It supports up to four external 4K displays and has a privacy shutter for the webcam. Of course, it comes with Kubuntu 22.04 and some special tools to configure all of its features. It looks like a tuxedo laptop with a specific branding and some specific configurations, and it starts shipping in a few days. Of course, some of the profits will be paid directly to Kubuntu and KDE, so if you want to support these projects, that's the laptop you want to buy. And speaking of Tuxedo, they're our new channel sponsor. Tuxedo makes devices that run Linux out of the box. I've reviewed a lot of them on the channel and they're great. You have tons of choice from small and affordable laptops to the biggest gaming or production desktops. Each device has a plethora of options to configure it to your needs and they can engrave a custom logo on your device. They have that all important Tux branded super key and they also ship worldwide with a large variety of keyboard layouts. For example, they recently upgraded their Stellaris 15, a super powerful gaming laptop with the best Intel or AMD CPUs, Nvidia RTX graphics, and a full aluminium chassis. I reviewed the previous model and I really enjoyed using it. Click the link in the description below if you want to learn more about all the stuff that Tuxedo has to offer. They are really, really good. So, thanks everyone for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, and especially to turn on notifications if you want to see my videos in your subscription feed, or at all. If you didn't like the video, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. And if you want to help me make more of these, you can also join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly Patreon cast on Mondays, or on Tuesdays when I'm a bit too lazy on Monday nights, or <laughs> the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!